in. So in this, in this show presentation, we'll talk about both Stellium and eBPF. Why both? Because they really come together. One doesn't really work without the other. Um, in particular, uh, eBPF uh, or what Stellium does would not be possible without eBPF. So what is Stellium? Stellium is cloud native networking, security and observability. Um, so essentially a security and observability and routing at the networking layer, um, in particular for OpenShift, but of course for any other Kubernetes distributions uh, as well. As I said, my name is Thomas. I'm co-founder and CTO of Isovalent. Isovalent is the company that created uh, the Cilium project. It's been founded by the creators of Cilium. We're heavily invested in eBPF and Cilium. We have co-created eBPF together with uh, Facebook and other engineers who created Cilium. And many of our uh, employers and engineers have long-term open source backgrounds, many from Red Hat. Myself, I've been at Red Hat for 10 years. I really enjoyed my time there. So big part of my heart will always be wearing a red fedora as well. We're, we're dual, dual headquarters in the US and Switzerland because I'm Swiss, I love skiing, uh, hence we have a presence in Switzerland as well. In the presentation today, we will mostly focus on Cilium and eBPF, both are open source project. Isovalent is the company behind that and we provide an enterprise distribution of Cilium. So if you want to leverage Cilium, in an enterprise environment, for example, on OpenShift, feel free to reach out to us and we can talk enterprise distribution. So let's jump right in and have a glance at Cilium. So Cilium provides a lot of different functionality, including networking and load balancing. Many of you may have heard about Cilium as a CNI. This is the networking layer of Kubernetes. But we can also provide a kube proxy replacement so we can implement Kubernetes services in the latest version, also an ingress. As an ingress controller, we can do multi-cluster visibility, routing, policy enforcement, and we can even run on legacy machines, so on virtual machines or metal machines and integrate external workloads into the mesh as well. Then we have a very rich set of network security capabilities. Obviously, we implement network policy. Uh, and very specifically, we can do this identity-based, but we also do things like transparent encryption using IPsec and or WireGuard. And then the last of the three big pillars is observability. We provide a lot of network metrics, network flow visibility, and even a service dependency graph or a service map, as we'll see later on. So that's kind of the very quick elevator pitch of, of Cilium, what it is. What is unique about Cilium is that at the foundation of it is this new Linux kernel technology, eBPF. I mean, it's relatively new in kernel terms. I've been a kernel developer my entire career. And from a kernel perspective, eBPF is new. Uh, from a, in an absolute years, it's not that new. It has been invented in 2014, so it's been around for eight years. But in terms of uh, kernel technology, it's much more modern compared to, for example, IP tables, which is over 20 years old. So what is eBPF? It obviously had this, has this cute mascot. What is it and why are so many people so excited about eBPF? In, in terms of understanding eBPF, it's actually not that challenging, not that difficult. eBPF is essentially a virtual machine that allows to run a eBPF program when a certain event happens in the Linux kernel. In this example, we are seeing when that happens for a system call. For example, when a user space application performs a system call, such as the exec system call, for example, when a bash or a shell executes a new command, we can run an eBPF program and, for example, as in this case, extract some visibility. But we could also, for example, block this system call. This is how SecComp eBPF works. Or we could provide additional visibility. We can uh, attach these eBPF programs when we receive or transmit network packets or when trace points are being hit and so on. If we took that, take that into more abstract terms, it's really something very, very similar to what JavaScript is for your browser. So think about JavaScript and how JavaScript enables programmability inside of a web browser. eBPF offers very similar programmability, but in the Linux kernel. And this is very specific, uh, very, very unique that we can have a Linux kernel or an operating system specific programming language to essentially dynamically extend the capabilities of the operating system. 
Now I'm saying Linux kernel here because eBPF has been invented as part of the Linux kernel community. However, recently it's actually been ported to the Windows platform as well. So eBPF is now available on Windows kernels as well, which now makes it possible for Cilium and other eBPF projects to actually run on Windows as well. To give you an idea of what type of impact this can have, and this is just one of uh, hundreds of different examples, this, are, this is a benchmark of HTTP visibility done in eBPF or using a proxy-based uh, mechanism. Proxy-based could be Nginx, HAProxy, Envoy, whatever proxy, it doesn't matter that much, but essentially parsing HTTP protocol, for example, to do um, tracing, uh, open telemetry tracing, for example, for microservices, for a service mesh, and doing this in eBPF in kernel, and the minimal additional latency that it adds, you can see this uh, blue baseline and red in eBPF, and then compared to the massive additional latency that a proxy-based implementation does because it has to go to user space and back to kernel and so on, it shows this massive potential in terms of technology. This is one out of many examples on how we use eBPF, and shows the, the, the pure potential of it. But if we take this to a higher level, this is what it essentially gets down to. Um, the kernel space has been very challenging to innovate in because of what's described in this quick story here. Typically, most users don't want to consume bleeding edge kernel versions. That's why many use, for example, a kernel distribution provided by Red Hat. And obviously you want a stable and mature Linux kernel version, which means you don't want to download the latest and greatest kernel image and compile it yourself from kernel.org and run it in your production. This means that you're typically running a kernel that is years old with additional backports on top. But this made it very challenging for kernel developers to actually innovate because by the time the kernel versions with the new features came into the hand of end users, the requirements had already changed. I remember well from my days at Red Hat when I was working on early versions of OpenShift where we had to uh, essentially build in new kernel functionality to uh, allow for some of the, the scalability requirements of OpenShift. And it was then to take, would take years for these uh, kernel versions to make it into the hands of customers, which was always frustrating. This is why we have seen so much of networking, observability, and other functionality move out of the kernel space and into user space. With eBPF, this is dramatically different because similar to a Linux kernel module, but in a safe manner, we can load additional functionality at runtime without risking to crash the kernel, without risking to compromise the kernel, without risking to create security incidents um, at runtime when needed, which means we can now uh, essentially innovate in real time and make new functionality available to end users and customers right away. So this new kind of development principle um, allowed or enabled a big wave of innovation, very similar to how JavaScript has enabled this innovation for web browsers. If you think back 10, 15, 20 years, right, we were uh, used or used to upgrading our web, our web browsers to, to load certain websites. And then with the introduction of JavaScript and other dynamic languages, it became possible that entire word processing software got replaced by in-browser application where, which, was, which is significant and nobody would have guessed this 20 years ago. Something very, very close to that is now happening in the Linux kernel with eBPF. So this is why um, eBPF is becoming popular so quickly, quickly because we can leverage the strategic high ground of the Linux kernel with eBPF and actually do innovation. That's the entire premise that Cilium and other eBPF projects are built on top of. This is the entire landscape of eBPF. So we see an actual kernel runtime component at the bottom. Think of this as the sandbox environment where the programs actually run. It consists of a verifier, chip compiler, maps and APIs and so on, and the actual OS runtime. This is where it all started. And then we have a bunch of SDKs on top uh, for Python, Go, C++, Rust, and so on, allowing to write eBPF programs in more approachable languages. And then the actual end user facing projects such as BCC, Cilium, Falco, Catron, BPF Trace, and there are many, many more. Uh, there's a new eBPF projects every couple of weeks, and they're all solving um, 
or providing solutions in the overall space of networking, security, observability, tracing, and performance benchmarking. EBPF is now um, uh, found, or governed by an EBPF foundation. You can see the founding members. Uh, since then, we've uh, uh, gotten a lot additional members, including Red Hat um, as well. So EBPF has quickly become an industry standard for operating system um, language extension. So switching gears a little bit and actually going into Cilium. So Cilium uses EBPF for everything that it does. And it essentially allows or uses EBPF to build a next generation networking, network security and observability platform that then utilizes EBPF to its full extent. And this has an advantage over other solutions or existing solutions that are built on IP tables, open research, and so on. Because with EBPF, there are almost no limits. Like it's almost a general purpose programming language, which means we can do whatever we want. Whereas with something like IP tables or open research, we are there programmable to some extent, but within certain boundaries. For example, open research has a programmable flow table. So you can program whatever this flow engine, this flow logic can do, but you only have certain limits that you have to operate within within there. And with eBPF, there's almost no limits. If we look into the actual feature set, I will go into that. We have built a ton of functionality with eBPF. So typically we see a couple of stages that we uh, see customers or users go through when they embark onto a Kubernetes or OpenShift journey. Starting from obviously basic pod and service connectivity where you get your clusters up and running and you install your first couple of apps. This is where you need connectivity. You need service connectivity, you need a bit of cluster hardening, you may be installing container image scanning and things like this. But then when we get into stage two is when we start seeing some of the more advanced security functionality come into play, such as enabling zero trust network security, transparent encryption, compliance monitoring, uh, monitoring application availability SLAs, for example, uh, monitoring what is the HTTP latency of my services that I offer to customers, or what is the rate of HTTP 500 error codes, or what is the TCP latency? How does that correlate with uh, CPU load? And you may have heard of golden signal dashboards, so Lim can provide them. But also things like efficient load balancing, replacing queue proxy, the static egress gateway, where we can essentially map dynamic pods with constantly changing IPs and map them to static source IPs. So we can more easily um, punch holes into traditional firewalls, which are not cloud native aware, so they only understand IPs, all the way into kind of microservices uh, in stage three, where you have a highly dynamic DICD pipeline, you want multi-cluster connectivity, Need layer seven observability for HTTP, Kafka, Cassandra, Memcached, gRPC, and so on. Um, we might be extending scale and churn, and even go into multi-cloud or hybrid cloud use cases. Well, all of this functionality we are implementing with eBPF in a very native and efficient way. Double-clicking a little bit on the networking side, so we have a. a, a a big bucket of the networking side is obviously connectivity. At the base of this is Cilium as a CNI, which can do IPv4, IPv6. It can do a variety of topologies. It can, for example, run in direct routing mode with BGP or integrating with the cloud provider SDN. It can also create overlay networks with VXLAN, Geneve, IPIP, and so on. So it makes it ideal to actually run Cilium both on-premise, but also in the cloud as well. We also have advanced um, capabilities such as SRV6, NAT4.6, interesting for telcos and high scale users as well. Then on the load balancing side, that's the lower left bucket, we have a very efficient queue proxy replacement. And in the 111 version as beta and in the upcoming 112 as stable, a full ingress controller implementation as well. So all of the layer seven capabilities, but then we can also act as a static or as a standalone north south load balancer. So balancing traffic into clusters as well. So you can turn any Linux machine into a full blown maglev based load balancer with direct server return capabilities and even replace very expensive hardware load balancers. That's the connectivity side. The middle bucket here is everything around network security. 
Obviously, we implement network policy, Kubernetes network policy. On top of that, we have Cilium network policies as an additional CRDs, which can do, for example, DNS-based policies. So you can, uh, for example, allow DNS-based wildcards. We can do layer seven policies and so on. All of this is, is it being enforced using identities. So we're not just mapping to IP addresses. We're actually very similar to MTLS allocating security identities and enforcing based on that. And of course, we can also do in kernel transparent encryption of all the network traffic, either using IPsec, which is FIPS compliant, or WireGuard, which is a bit more modern, sometimes more efficient, but often not seen as FIPS compatible or FIPS compliant. And then the last bucket here on the right is extending the mesh, so connecting multiple clusters together, or connecting non containerized, non Kubernetes workloads into the or connecting them with kubernetes clusters so you could for example have your openshift cluster running in cloud run Cilium there and also run Cilium on a fleet of ec2 instances or on a fleet of metal machines running big databases and connect them together in a seamless fashion and for example access your oracle database from um, a openshift cluster Looking into the security side of everything, and we'll double click on the lower left piece here, this efficient identity aware network and runtime visibility. We have a lot of visibility that we can feed into an SIM platform, including flow logs, including metrics, including um, network tap and IDS insert insertion capabilities. Obviously, this could be, I'm listing two popular SIM platforms here, obviously, with the Fluent D integration, this can literally go into any platform that you want. I double click, I, or I, I, I mentioned that I want to double click on this lower left example, like what, what is this combined network and runtime visibility? Um, this example shows a typical network-based five-tuple flow log. It's showing an AWS flow log, but you will get this type of IP to IP on this port type visibility from most network uh, solutions. It, it's okay, it gives you some visibility, but it's often limited in use because containers constantly change IP addresses. Cilium provides flow visibility as well, but on a much deeper and much more useful level. So at the first glance, this doesn't even look like network visibility, but it is. You can see on the left side kind of the source identity, who is making calls. You can see a namespace, a pod name. You can see the process ancestry tree. So you see that it's a container runtime, Docker D, container D in, in this case, are uh, spawning a binary called crawler, which is going to be containerized, which is running a node app. And then you can also see sub processes. And then for those of you familiar with a reverse shell and how that looks like, this is exactly how it looks like, where an attacker is using netcat to reach out of the cluster, receive instructions, and then use uh, curl from a bash to actually poke around um, extract data from Elasticsearch, as we can see on the right side, and actually upload that onto an AWS S3 bucket as well. So on the right side, you can see the destination identity, whether it's DNS-based or Kubernetes service-based. Very interesting, all of this can go into your SIM as well, or with Fluent D into any logging platform that you might What's unique about Cilium is that it can not only operate on layer, layer four, for example, this is where OpenShift, or Open vSwitch and OpenShift, Open vSwitch operates. Um, Cilium can also do layer seven. So you can also say, uh, yes, I want this part to talk to this other part, but only allow a HTTP get to slash public. And for example, not allow a get to slash private or not allow a post or a patch or some other HTTP method. This is the DNS-based policy I've mentioned. So you can essentially wildcard names, for example, star.mydomain.io. And what's very unique about this is that you can actually authorize the DNS requests themselves. So you can say, pod is allowed to look up google.com. And then if it's trying to look up anything other than google.com, that DNS resolution will feign. And if, if it is allowed, it will actually only allow the IPs that have been returned by the DNS. Um, specifically those that have been returned. So it's not in, it's not polling, it's actually acting as a transparent proxy. This is incredibly nice to label um, policies for endpoints that are outside of the cluster, potentially with IPs or backed by IPs that are region specific. So if you deploy your app into different regions, 
maybe if you access api.twitter.com, you will receive different APIs depending on where, where in what regions you run your service. And last but not least, let's switch forward to the observability piece. This is called Hubble. Hubble provides a wide variety of visibility, including this nice service map. Um, this service map shows what apps are running, which pods are running, and how they are connected together. Again, it can do this on layer three all the way to layer seven. So it understands not only TCP and UDP and the network level, but also HTTP, Kafka, Cassandra, Memcached, and a variety of other protocols. All of this visibility you can see graphically, or you can feed this into your SIM or into Timescape, which is our ClickHouse based time series database where you can store all of this network connectivity data and essentially create a time machine to, so you can then look back and see what was dropped, what was forwarded, who talked to whom. So you can look back one month ago, what, what type of DNS solutions did this, um, did this service make and so on. Obviously, we can also do a lot of um, metrics. So all of the, from based on this um, visibility that we have, we can create very nice Prometheus and Grafana based dashboards, for example, and this in the middle is showing the favorite dashboard of everybody, the DNS dashboard, like this is the go-to dashboard for most folks. Here you can see, is my app failing because of DNS? So you can see which pods are currently subject of, or subject to DNS failures. When was the last failure? What type of failure? What are the type of DNS resolutions that are happening? And so on. Obviously we can do this for a wide variety of things. We can do HTTP latencies, distribution of HTTP methods, uh, volume. You can, for example, measure how much multi-region traffic do I have because your cloud provider will charge extra. Or you can measure the control plane traffic of OpenShift and so on. You can see how much traffic is going to the control plane, how much traffic is exchanged between worker nodes, how much staying on the same node, and so on and so on. A ton of uh, visibility that you get here for troubleshooting, for Accounting, even for application teams to understand what is my app even doing. And then last but not least, we also have a network policy editor, which is graphical, where you can uh, review and analyze all your Kubernetes network policy and all your Selim network policy, and you can graphically edit uh, them. The tool will also recommend you and make proposals on how to improve your security posture as well. The last piece here is the GitOps network policy guardrails, which is allowing to uh, delegate part of the policy, the network policy patient teams. Often you don't want to fully delegate full control over all network policy to application teams, but only allow certain aspects to be allowed by the app team. For example, you want to grant application teams to allow within a namespace. Um, and check in such network policies into a Git repository. And then as soon as, as, soon as application teams want to um, allow into the cluster, so expose their app publicly or allow cross namespace traffic, then this GitOps guardrail will automatically uh, require a pull request to be reviewed by, for example, a security team member. This integration currently works with GitHub and GitLab, but can obviously be, the, be extended into any GitOps file workflow as well. And with that, um, I want to leave you with a couple of pointers before we switch over to Brandon um, to look into the OpenShift installer. Obviously, if you're interested in Cilium, the website is cilium.io um, in eBPF, eBPF.io, where you can find getting started guides, tutorials on both Cilium and eBPF. We maintain the Cilium and eBPF Slack with over 10,000 people where you can find help not only on Cilium, but also eBPF. And as I mentioned, if you're interested in a enterprise distribution of Cilium, feel free to reach out to us on isovalent.com. And with that, again, if you have questions on Cilium, feel free to ask them in the Q&A section. I will try to answer as many as possible while Brandon speaks as well. Well, obviously, if I don't have time on, on, the, on this Q&A section, feel free to ping me or other team members on the Cilium Slack as well. So with that, thank you very much, and I will hand it over to Brendan. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so I want to extend a warm welcome to everybody. I'm really happy to see that you're here. Attendance is really good. If you have any questions when we go over the next section, please leave them in the comments. Um, and I'll address those as well, and we'll leave a little bit of time afterwards 
um, to answer some questions and follow up. So my name is Brandon Joza. I'm a, an associate principal SA in the Telco um, North America region. So most of the things that we do, um, I'm actually a Tiger team member, um, and most of the things that we do are very technical. Uh, we work with uh, Telco specifically, and there's a lot of networking in Telco. So I have a Telco background. I was in Telco ever since college, and uh, I've been at Red Hat for the last couple of years. So anyone in Telco, you pretty much have to have a, a networking PhD. So networking is very important to Telco. So what we'll cover is um, the installation of Cilium on top of OpenShift. One thing I want to point out is uh, I can refer you over to uh, the Cilium uh, documentation. Uh, they have good documentation on how to get it installed um, using one method. And we're going to talk about a different method today, one that's not talked about as much um, because it's newer, but it was just GA'd. So we'll get into this. And uh, with that, we'll talk about four different options to get things or get OpenShift installed. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, a user provisioned infrastructure, uh, an installer provisioned infrastructure, the assisted installer, and zero touch provisioning, which is uh, uh, which is just recent. Um, so Thomas mentioned the GitOps approach. Uh, you can take this GitOps approach from the bare metal all the way through, uh, all the way through your uh, network policies, if you wish. So there's some when you when you try to align yourself with the installation method there's some things to consider and I'll cover those. So with user provisioned infrastructure, the things that it's very good at is uh, it's been around since the beginning. Uh, it provides full provisioning uh, control of o the OpenShift deployment. It's highly customizable for custom bootstraps on various cloud providers, including bare metal. The only downside is that it's, it requires heavy preparation and uh, understanding prior to the cluster deployment. It requires you to have um, uh, either um, supporting infrastructure, which would be a bootstrap node, uh, DHCP in place, or static IP addressing, depending on what you choose. Um, it requires a bit of planning. <clears throat> and it's a bit more complex for just getting in and doing an evaluation or a proof of concept. And so what I want to do is piggyback off of what Thomas is presenting today and give you a very quick way to uh, evaluate it, proof of concept uh, for your environment and so forth. So we'll get into some other options. So then we get into installer provisioned infrastructure, and this is in fact what's mentioned on the Cilium website. It provides full automation for the underlying cloud infrastructure. So um, in the examples provided by Cilium, it's using AWS, for example, it provides an excellent user experience. And this is something that I'm very passionate about at, um, at Red Hat. I've worked with Thomas's team to, um, in, to uh, improve the experience on the Red Hat side, on the OpenShift side, working with customers out in the field. Um, but this gives you a little bit less control for things like static network address, static network addressing and other integrations, uh, CNI being one of them. Um, so you can uh, essentially generate your manifest ahead of time and then you can deploy it. So that's the way that you would do IPI. Uh, but other integrations or static networking can be a, a bit challenging. Then we're going to go over the assisted installer and that provides an excellent user experience. It includes a great user interface along with an excellent API. We'll go over that a little bit um, a little bit later. It doesn't require an external load balancer for the default CNIs, um, but if you're evaluating um, Stellium, I would get with that team and talk with them about some options there. Uh, but it doesn't require an additional bootstrap ho host. It actually reuses the bootstrap host in the process, and we'll cover that in detail here. It's easy to add additional day two workers if you need to. Um, but things like uh, uh, the only downside with this is that additional features are actually provided via the API, but not a, a not necessarily the GUI. So, for example, if you want to get Cilium or other integrations um, into the cluster at bootstrap time, um, there's a couple ways to do that. And that's what we're going to cover. That's why I want to cover this today. And the workflow can be a little bit different since we're not since we're reusing the bootstrap host. If you're familiar with the uh, IPI method or the UPI method, uh, this may seem a little bit different because the workflow is different, but we're going to cover that today. And the assisted installer is also a part of the zero touch provisioning model, which is um, in essence for bare metal primarily, uh, but it can be used for other cloud providers as well. Um, and so if you have questions on zero touch provisioning and a GitOps model, uh, or I would say a full stack GitOps model, 
uh, then please talk to uh, uh, talk to your Red Hat representatives, and they'll uh, put you in touch with uh, folks like myself, and we can uh, help get that deployed for you. So today we're going to cover the assisted installer, and we'll go into detail on what this looks like. So um, why discuss the assisted installer? There's a few reasons. So I said that I was passionate about the user experience. I think that's very, very important. It lowers the bar to entry if you want to evaluate different things for your environment. Um, so I am being a good example of this. It includes an API, so the API can um, be leveraged a little bit further. So I talked to the folks over at Bell, it's okay to mention them, uh, but they are in fact using this method. Um, they're using Cilium, they're using the APIs that we provide, and they're doing some incredible work. And that's all because, um, that's all because the components within their stack is API driven, so they can build some unique tooling around that. Uh, but it also provides a GUI, uh, a GUI support as well, and I'll cover that also. And it's great for demonstrating. This allows you to demonstrate POCs very quickly, um, evaluate function uh, functionality and so forth. And uh, overall, it's a great experience. Uh, general, general availability was uh, just this past month. Uh, so now it's GA. So the clusters that were created have always been supported, uh, but the assisted installer itself um, was continually iterating and taking customer feedback and improving. And so now we're at a point where we can say that that is, uh, that is generally available. So the basic workflow, I'm gonna switch, context switch just a little bit to show you the uh, user interface uh, just for the sake of time. I think we can build a cluster in about 20 minutes, but uh, in case we can't, or in case we're right at the edge, I'm gonna show you the user interface um, for the assisted installer. Um, and talk about the GUI for a little bit. So if you want to create a cluster, you can just create a cluster, give it the cluster name, say name, example.com, select the version. We can install an SNO, which is great for evaluation. Um, we also support ARM64 as well. And all you need to do is click next. And then it says that it's waiting for hosts. This is where we're going to context switch again and go back into the process. So when it says waiting for hosts, what is that? What does that actually mean? So, yeah, jump yes. Over. We're not seeing your screen yet. Oh, really? I've been sharing slides this whole time. Thanks for telling me. I, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you told me that. You've been so entertaining. It's actually only noticed when you're clearly talking about a particular screen. A slide. I know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Okay, can you see my, can you see my deck now? I think it's coming up. People in the chat say if they're seeing the screen right now. I think it's still now right now. Okay, let me. Uh... It's not showing. Yeah, we tested this too. Give me one second. Let me stop and start again. All right, so share screen. And I think it actually worked for some some people before. Okay. So now it's, it I says it's that it's sharing now. Is it sharing now? If not, I can share a tab. Yeah, some people see it, so go go ahead. Okay, great. All right. So you will get the slides. So you didn't miss anything. Um, you'll get the slides, and and we'll send those on. So when talking about the assisted installer, and thanks again, Thomas. I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, that helps a lot. <laughs> So when talking about the assisted installer, the general overview is that you'll give it just some basic, um, um, some basic uh, information, the cluster name, the base domain name, the cluster version, whether you want an SNO or a single node open shift as we call that, or a multi-node deployment, and then your CPU architecture, um, specifically if you want an ARM64. This will allow you to generate an ISO now, in the recent versions, you can also create static networking and so forth. And um, you'll download the ISO, insert the ISO, and then the ISO will include an agent with the uh, user credentials to talk back to um, the API for the assisted installer. And from there, um, the host will show up into the user interface, and we'll cover that in just a little bit. What's great about this is it provides pre-flight validation. So it'll validate whether the host can actually run OpenShift, whether the sizes are correct, whether the disks are correct. It'll even uh, check 
for network connectivity. So if there's latency on the network or if there's um, if the network is experiencing some issues, DNS issues or so forth, it'll tell you how to resolve those issues. And this is the benefit of having a, an API that um, an agent can talk back and forth with. And then it'll guide the user through the rest of the configuration and deployment. So this is great. But I mentioned that um, if you want to do custom CNI, where is that option in the GUI? Well, that can be used with another command line utility, which is written around the API. And that command line utility is called the um, AI CLI. So we'll talk about how to get Cilium installed specifically if you want to change the uh, if you want to change the CNI. So again, what we'll do is we'll create the cluster and we'll create the cluster with um, uh, the cluster name and a parameter file. That parameter file I'll give in an example. Um, I've got some documentation at the very end of this slide that um, will be sent to you. Um, and what will happen is that will create a shell of the container or a shell of the uh, of the uh, installation. Then what we'll need to do is update the install config for the network type, which is Cilium. And then we will uh, give it a directory, which will upload the Cilium manifest. Let me show you how this works in action here um, so we can context switch a bit. So what I've got is variables for the cluster that I want to build. So the cluster name is OCP-ZTP uh, because I use this for zero touch provisioning, usually in demonstrations. We have a base domain of test.telco.ocp.run, uh, a pull secret, and then our networking uh, information here. What I'm going to do is I showed you this uh, cluster initially. Let me show you cluster that I previously built. So ICP ZTP. What you'll notice is once this is completed, You'll have a URL that you can use to get to the cluster. It'll include the password for that cluster and it'll include your, your kube config. So everything is available. You can see everything about the hosts, et cetera. So you see that this is 64 gig of RAM, how many cores, et cetera. So what we'll do is we'll uh, delete this cluster. What you'll notice is that it doesn't actually delete my OpenShift cluster itself. So you can be confident that that's still there. But what we did was we deleted the installation uh, manifest on the SaaS service, which is, uh, um, which is the, assisted, the assisted service. Their cluster remains the same. Nothing has changed. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to rebuild this, the cluster create. And as this is going, I'll just refresh this, you'll see that the cluster installation has returned, but it's waiting for hosts. And on the background, what I'm doing is I'm uploading the Cilium manifest. This is the Cilium manifest. I think this is for 1.11.3, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I think the most recent version is 1.11.5, I believe. I'm um, so you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Um, but we're uploading the manifest into the installation. And so what that's going to do is during a pause period, that's going to load these manifests so that way the uh, OpenShift installation can pause, load the Cilium CNI, and then you'll be default to the uh, Cilium CNI. And so um, when we go back to the workflow here, this is what we're doing here is creating, creating the manifest and using a directory. Uh, so we're just uploading the entire directory. And then we're uh, sending that request to the um, API. Now this is done again with a, a command line utility. This is also at the back of the deck, so you'll have all these links. You'll have a, a, a bunch of links. Once the virtual media is either installed on bare metal, or in this case, I'm just using um, uh, Verse Tools with a, uh, um, with a Kimu hypervisor backend. So once the ISO is loaded, uh, you just simply turn on the machines, and the machines will then uh, take any static network configuration, use that to uh, uh, talk to the gateway and outbound, talk to the REST API on the um, assisted service side, and then it will, uh, it will get its role. If it's a master, if it's a worker, those roles will be assigned automatically. Um, then you'll update the, uh, any host names if needed or update any additional parameters uh, for the installation. Uh, that can be done with the CLI or it can be done uh, within the GUI itself. And then what will happen is 
one host will be used as the bootstrap host and two hosts will then, um, out of the three, two hosts will be used to bring up the permanent control plane. So if I were to check on our installation now, these hosts are coming in and you'll notice uh, for a split second there, if you could see it, they all came in as localhost. And what I did was through, through using the API, I told the API to rename these hosts um, a permanent name uh, based on the uh, UUID of the virtual machine. So we can see now the details of the machine. Um, it's grabbing NTP status right now, but here are the cores, here's the memory. You can see the network um, here. We can do IPv6, we can do IPv4, whichever have you. Uh, but the Cilium component has been loaded or staged, pre-staged in the deployment itself now. So what's gonna happen is once these uh, machines have been validated and are passing, uh, we'll start the installation of OpenShift itself. So the bootstrap will, I mentioned that there's a uh, bootstrap component. And once these begin, we'll be able to see which uh, of the hosts uh, become the bootstrap. And that's going to be used to locally distribute machine configs and all of the um, uh, roles and so forth to the other uh, other machines within the cluster. Right now you can see that the roles are auto assigned, uh, but we'll use the API. And again, uh, the script that I was using before, we're using the API to automatically assign the bootstrap, which is this host right here. And then you can see that these other two machines are being, um, are being used as control plane nodes. So those are going to be our permanent control plane nodes. Um, and then the bootstrap will ultimately be reused and added into the pool at which point you can start using OC commands. So again, this was a demonstration very quick to cover how you can get Cilium installed. So there are a few options. The documentation on the Cilium website is really good. It shows an API method. If you're using bare metal or if you're interested in using an API, build some tooling around it, or if you're interested in using a command line um, utility to uh, inject the manifest automatically using the assisted installer, uh, this is an absolutely great method as well. And that's it. I didn't want to take too much time today, and I want to leave some additional time for questions if you have any. Um, really, it's Cilium that's the show today. Um, but at the end of the slide deck, I provided uh, several uh, resources. Um, I typically either blog or talk about this stuff on, on Twitter. So I included my information in here along with several different links that you can use to get more information on the assisted installer, any of the zero touch provisioning GitOps model. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either your um, Red Hat representatives or me directly on any of the links provided here. And that's it. I just really want to kind of augment uh, the installation uh, methods along with Cilium since uh, Thomas got everybody hyped up on, on Cilium today. Well, that's it. Thomas, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, let's actually, uh, I, I've been busy answering questions in the Q&A, and I think um, two questions kind of came, came up um, repeatedly. First of all, uh, obviously the two most frequently asked questions <laughs> were, will this be recorded? Yes, uh, to being able, I think, make the recording available for everybody. And yes, both Brandon and myself will share our slide text uh, as well. So I think um, one question that came up was around multi-cluster, and Istio and how do the two relate to each other? Uh, do I need Istio? Do I need Cilium? Do I need both? Can I run both? Uh, what are the trade-offs? Um, so I think, first of all, Cilium has a variety of modes. It can run it, so it gives you choice. So first of all, you can run Cilium and Istio in whatever Istio flavor you want, completely separate, and they're not aware of each other. They're completely compatible. So you can run Cilium as the CNI for your OpenShift cluster and run Istio on top. In that mode, Cilium can actually benefit Istio already in a variety of ways. For example, it can avoid the unencrypted traffic between app and sidecar. So for several customers uh, running Istio, it has been a compliance problem that technically the, the traffic between the app and the sidecar proxy is a network packet and it is unencrypted because the sidecar will do MTLS on behalf of the app. And that did break compliance requirements because 
anybody with CatNet admin privileges can wiretap into that traffic, even if it stays on that same node. Compliance regulations are sometimes not as flexible. In that, in that world, Cilium can actually remove that unencrypted traffic with an eBPF feature called SoftMap. So that's kind of um, stage one, uh, where you run Istio and Cilium completely separate. Then you can run stage two, which is Cilium's Istio integration. And in this setup, you are making Cilium aware of Istio. And you deploy Istio, and for any layer seven policies that you configure in Istio uh, and in Cilium, they are both enforced in the Istio sidecar. So in that world, even if you run Istio with MTLS, you can define your Cilium network policies from layer three to layer seven, and whatever layer seven policies are defined, they will be enforced in the sidecar. And then the last option is using the Cilium service mesh which is using a combination of Envoy and Cilium. So it provides the, the same capabilities, you can do retry, circuit breaking, traffic management, ingress, MTLS, and so on. The difference there is that it does not use a sidecar or it does not require you to use a sidecar. You can define your own granularity of proxies that you wanna run. So you can run one proxy per node or you can run one proxy per namespace whatever granularity that you want. So more similar to what ingress or how ingress would look uh, like as well. So you have these three options. The benefits are probably obvious, but I will mention them. If you don't have to run so many sidecars, you obviously uh, consume a significant uh, amount of fewer resources to run all of those boxes. Another big benefit is that because Cilium moves the MTLS, um, implementation out of the proxy entirely. It is not required to share the secrets, the certificates, the keys with anything that is in the data path. So let's assume you're running WebAssembly extensions in your service mesh. In the event that some of that gets compromised uh, or is misbehaving um, and the proxy gets compromised, it cannot access any of these secrets and certificates because they're not actually um, part of the, the proxy. The MTLS portion is done outside. Also, I think in the talk earlier, I showed performance numbers in doing HTTP visibility with eBPF only and the benefit of that. So for some of use cases, we don't even need Envoy at all, and it's all entirely um, in eBPF. I think there's another question that just came in that we can answer. Is Cilium supported in OKD, and is the installer available for OKD? We have two customer clusters and a demo cluster running OKD for now, and would wish to demo Cilium using the, the demo cluster. So right now, and Brandon can complement this right now, Cilium is obviously certified on OpenShift as an operator and also a certified DNI. Uh, we have started a process on this on the managed OpenShift uh, variation as well, but that's still in process as of now. Do you want to add anything, Brandon? No, this is exciting, actually. I've been really enjoying working with the team. Yes, certified all the way. Awesome. And then another question, are you or will you be doing anything in regards to the open telemetry initiative within the CNCF landscape in regards to the observability part of Cilium? Is there any added value in regards to standardization? So the good news is there is already an open telemetry collector available for Hubble, the observability layer of Cilium. So you can use open telemetry to export all of the observability that Cilium has, whether it's metrics or logs or network logs, HTTP traces, even network policy drops you can output as open telemetry traces as well. This is currently in beta mode and it will move out of beta in 112, the release that is coming in the next couple of weeks. So you now have choice between um, pure JSON flow logs and you can export them with FluentD anywhere you want or open telemetry, Prometheus metrics with Grafana or be pre bay Grafana dashboards on top. So we are obviously committed to supporting uh, whatever open standards make. Another question I saw two times was eVPN VGP support. So this is something we're currently working on. If you're interested in this, feel free to reach out to us on Slack um, and we can validate what, whether our roadmap actually meets the requirements uh, that you have. In general, I think with the flexibility of eBPF, 
um, and with the wide variety and wide support of the Go community in terms of control plane components, we're able to iterate and innovate very quickly. Um, and as usual with eBPF, there's very few limits in terms of what is possible. It's mostly about standardization and figuring out what are, what are the requirements of the maturity of. And I saw one more question that I think, yes, here, is it possible to use NF tables and Cilium in the same cluster or their points of conflicts? I'll broaden, broaden up this question a little bit more uh, in terms of more broadly IP tables and also Cube proxy, which is based on IP tables for the most part. There's obviously also an IPVS based implementation of Cube proxy, but most users will be running Cube proxy in IP tables uh, mode. Um, so first of all, eBPF and uh, IP tables are completely separate. They don't conflict with each other per se, so they're at, at different hook points. So you can run Cilium together with any IP tables based solution if you want to. There is one specific mode of Cilium, it's called the fast path option. And this fast path option will bypass IP tables for a good reason. It gives you about a 20% performance benefit. Um, it's actually nice because it can lead to your pod to pod traffic to be faster than your host to host traffic. Because even if you have no IP tables rules in, in your host, even the presence of the IP tables net filter subsystem will add some overhead. So your host network stack might be slower than your eBPF based pod network stack because Slim is able to bypass the IP table stack. If you run with that mode enabled, then whatever IP tables rules you have on the host will not be uh, will not apply to your pod traffic. So if you want to have pod traffic um, applied or IP tables will apply to pod traffic, you need to disable that mode. Um, what are the last question that came in? What are the main differences between Cilium and Calico eBPF option? Um, so Calico by now also supports an eBPF-based data path option. Uh, the main difference is that the capabilities of the tool are not exactly the same. So Cilium has been using eBPF from the start. So we have been uh, we have several years of uh, advantage, let me put it that way. Um, so Cilium simply has advanced or extended functionality that cannot be found in the Calico eBPF data path. I think a big portion is a lot of the observability the multi-cluster in layer 7 awareness, the service mesh, um, the DNS-based policies, and so on. It's a variety of options that are not uh, found in, the, in Calico's eBPF um, data path. But in general, like uh, there's lots of good things to be said about Calico as well. Um, I think it brought container networking forward a, a, huge, a huge portion. Um, and the Calico eBPF data path is also faster than the Calico IP tables. Portion. So it shows that eBPF is not necessarily Cilium versus Calico, it's also eBPF versus IP tables. eBPF is simply a better technology, a more advanced, uh, more efficient technology to build networking and security functionality, in particular if observability is uh, important as well, which essentially brings us back to the start of the talk. What's truly important is that not only to provide connectivity, but to provide that in a secure uh, fashion, but then to also provide a lot of observability, in particular around Kubernetes, microservices, OpenShift, and so on. A lot of things are fluid and ongoing, and any type of visibility and observability that you get will help you in, on day two, whether it's for compliance reasons, if you're under, under audit, for troubleshooting, if your app teams are asking you questions why something's not working, Observability is really key uh, in cloud native infrastructure. Let me scan if we have forgotten any questions, but I think we got to everything. Um, and with that, I will say thank you everybody for attending. Um, if questions come up uh, later on, feel free to come to the Cilium Slack. Simply go to Cilium.io, uh, click on the Slack button. You will find Brandon there as well if you have questions for Brandon. You can ask me, you can ask in one of the many, many channels um, on whether it's questions on eBPF, on Cilium, on running on OpenShift, getting a demo up and running. Feel free to reach out there and we'll be happy to answer all of them. Sorry, uh, I think there, there is a new question that just came <laughs> One more question. What are your plans for Cilium pricing? Is there going to be a price increase for the enterprise version in the near 
future. So if you're interested in Cillian Enterprise, feel free to uh, contact us on isurveillance.com or DM me on the Cillian Slack as well. I'm happy to answer any enterprise pricing related questions there as well. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.